Since Congress created real estate investment trusts in the 1960s, individual investors have been able to own shares of publicly traded real estate companies. REITs, as they're commonly known, must meet certain standards set by the IRS. Notably, this includes that a minimum of 90% of any taxable income is returned in the form of dividends to investors each year. Also, a REIT must invest at least 75% of its total assets in real estate or cash. In return, REITs don't have to pay tax at the corporate level. This means these types of investment firms can finance real estate deals more cheaply than most non-REIT companies. In turn, REITs have a unique opportunity to earn and disperse profits to shareholders. As a result, investing REITs can be quite nuanced. To help sort through this growing global real estate marketplace, we're fortunate to have with us today Katie Hendricks, a, sen a senior researcher and vice president at Dimensional Fund Advisors. Hi, Katie. Thanks for taking the time to discuss REITs with us today. Hi, Murray. Great to be here. Is this sort of favorable tax tr treatment the main difference between real estate development companies and REITs? Yeah, so REITs, as you mentioned, have a requirement to distribute a certain amount of their income um, in the form of dividends. And real estate development companies or real estate operating companies, they often invest in real estate related projects. But one important difference is that a real estate operating company does not need to distribute its earnings or meet the same asset or income tests as a REIT. Uh, as a result, in general, real estate operating companies can diversify their activities and engage in other areas of business outside of real estate. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, when we look at the real estate operating companies versus REITs, we see they tend to have higher market beta than REITs, uh, higher correlation with equity markets we typically see. Okay. Uh, let's start with some of the basics. How big is the REIT market and how much of the global market is real estate? About two to three percent of the global equity market is made up of REITs. Okay. And what's the breakdown between real estate stocks in the U.S., developed international, and emerging markets? Right now, it's roughly two thirds U.S. Um, using the S&P Global REIT Index as of November. It's about seventy percent U.S., twenty-five percent developed ex-U.S., and about five percent emerging markets. Okay. And how does DFA's Global Real Estate Fund reflects such geographic diversity? Generally, our fund is market cap weighted based on the eligible REIT universe. There may be some nuance around country eligibility uh, in our international portfolios. For example, uh, we excluded Taiwanese REITs for a while, but they were, um, or sorry, they were eligible in the dimensional REIT universe, but not in the index. Uh, there may also be some considerations about maturing of certain markets where we may wait a little bit to participate, but typically we're going to look pretty close to the market. Okay. And how does DFA select its real estate stocks for the Global Fund? Generally, looking at the market out there and including uh, the entire eligible REIT universe um, and weighting similar to the market. We may have some variation in sector allocations because we include uh, certain non-traditional REITs, such as tower REITs, uh, those that include maybe cell phone towers and some other non-traditional like data centers or billboards. Um, that might be some difference versus the index, but generally market cap weighted. Okay. Uh, isn't the REIT designation tied to provisions of the U.S. tax code? Um, are there actually REITs in international markets? Yes, that's right. So REITs are designated in the tax code. And as you mentioned, generally 75% of assets have to be in real estate and 90% of income has to be distributed to shareholders. Um, and although the rules vary country by country, REITs and REIT-like securities um, are around globally. And they're generally required to distribute a substantial percentage of their taxable income to shareholders annually. So for example, Canada has a designation also called REIT, at least 90% of taxable income must be distributed. So very similar to U.S. Mm -hmm. Ireland has a designated designation called REITs. They have to distribute at least 85%. So there may be some nuance, but a lot of similarity globally. I guess that's the reason why emerging markets don't have as many REITs. There's not those tax nuances in those markets yet. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. 
um, then are real estate stocks in other countries still considered to be REITs? I mean, uh, for your fund, you you can you uh, put them in, you include them in your uh, portfolios, correct? Yes, that's right. We include um, 20 plus markets in our global real estate portfolio. Um, actually, interestingly with REITs though, even though you can invest in this REIT-like legislation in 20 plus countries around the world, those REITs may own securities or assets in even more countries. So we actually yeah. see in our portfolio that you have geographic exposure um, to, to potentially you know dozens more countries, 65 potentially around the world. And then, of course, in REITs, just like everything else, there are different segments. Um, you know, we, we often talk about industrial real estate, commercial office real estate, apartment REITs, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, could you talk a little bit about the breakdown between the different industries? Sure. So uh, if we look again at the S&P Global REIT Index, most recently, we see the the biggest um, in, uh, industries represented there tend to, to be a retail um, and industrial as well as residential. So retail, for example, almost 20% of the index, industrial about 18%. Um, you also have quite a bit of weight in residential, diversified, office REITs, and then some smaller weight in healthcare, uh, about 8%, as well as hotel and resorts. Uh, that's the smallest at about 3%. Yeah, IFA, um, as well as DFA, we look at uh, real estate as a separate asset class. Um, is it still a good diversifier in your folks' research? Yeah, we also consider REITs to be a, a different asset class. And one example I would look at, uh, unlike most stocks, REITs primarily hold real estate assets. So we looked actually last year and we saw real estate stocks in the S&P 500 held on average 90% of assets in real property compared with less than 10% for other index constituents. Hmm, interesting. Then do you um, do you see a lot of growth in the real estate marketplace? Yeah, we do see um, as more countries adopt REIT and REIT-like legislation, definitely more opportunity. And we do see some growth, again, in this non-traditional sector, you know, billboards, data centers, these types of things. So definitely growing over time. Sure. But is real estate or REITs as an asset class, uh, does it tend to be uh, different volatil volatility characteristics than um, like a, the uh, blue chip stocks, U.S. stocks? Tends to be pretty similar in terms of market return and, and volatility. We don't expect major differences. There may, though, of course, be a higher dividend yield versus the rest of the market. Okay. But but these are definitely more volatile than bonds, correct? Yes, that's right. Okay. That's, okay. Yeah, you're looking at equity-like volatility as opposed to bond-like volatility. Okay. Thank you very much for your time today, Katie. Thanks, Murray.